Hi everyone, thanks for listening to another episode of Dogman Encounters Radio. I'm Vic Cundiff and I'll be your host for the show. If you've had an encounter of your own and would like to speak with me, whether in private or on the show, please go to dogmanencounters.com and submit a report. I'd love to hear from you. Tonight's show is a continuation of last week's show where Josh Turner was the guest. Let's not waste any time. Let's jump right back into it where Josh left off last week. That's Noah's story. That's what he told me. It was just contrasting his story to Abel's story. And I'm going to get into Abel's story. What he told me about Abel's story was pretty crazy. He said, you can talk to my brother and you can get more information from him than what I can tell you because he actually caught one of these things. (laughs) So He kind of left me with that. And like I said, his other two encounters, I'll get into those a little bit later. I'll go back to it. But he left me hanging with that. And so we talked a little more, but it wasn't anything about Dogman. It was about building hot rods and going to a brothel in Austin in the 60s. It was crazy. A bunch of crazy nonsense. So I ended up going, yeah, okay, you know, and, and it was very polite. And we talked and we got off the phone. A couple days later, I get in touch with Abel. It was a Sunday. He just got out of church. He's a deacon at his church. He's a real religious guy. He doesn't drink or do any of those things. I guess he used to at one point. He was drinking at one point and smoking cigars every day. And his house caught fire. So I'll tell you about that. But anyways, talk to Abel. And of course, I wanted to know everything I could about this dog man that he supposedly caught well he started from the beginning too and he basically just reiterated everything that noah had told me going back to the beginning with the hole that they covered up and he talked and of course the numbers were a little different you know it wasn't exact and identical but it was basically the same thing i got the gist of the same story but when i got to the part about his encounters he goes dude i've encountered these things over and over again. And then he said, every day for several months, I encountered one. And I'm like, how is that? And he says, because I caught one. That's what I wanted to know. And so I told him, I said, can you tell me about this? And he says, yeah, yeah. He said that back in the late 60s, now I'm not for sure, because these guys are, you know, they're getting up there in years. And I think that Abel's like 77 or something like that. I can't remember exactly what he said, 74 or something. He's old. So he said that he was out on the property Now, according to Noah, when he was away in Vietnam, this is when it happened, when he was gone. So he remembers seeing one of these things like that looked like that, but he wasn't there when this thing was caught. Now, apparently, Jerry, the guy that I originally met from the last interview, whatever I was telling you about, his dad, Andrew, he remembers this, supposedly, but he didn't really talk about it. But Abel and and one of his guys that worked for him, because at that point, he was kind of like the foreman of the ranch. He kind of had taken over. So he was checking the property, and he went down near that creek. And he said, right there near that creek that we played at as a kid, it was dry at that time. He said he went down there, and he found a dead one, a female. And I asked him about that, and I said, well, it was a female. And he says, it was definitely a female. And I said, how do you know? And he says, because it had teats. I was like, so what did they look like? What did it look like? He said that it had like what looked like female breasts on top with little like dog looking like how dogs would have, and they just went all the way down. And that's really weird. Like he said that it looked almost like a cross between human and dog. And so he said that the teeth went all the way down its body. And so I was blown away by that, you know. But then he tells me that they heard a whining noise, like a puppy whimpering, whining, and then almost like a moan. And so they went into the woods. He said, not far into the woods, but on the other side of the creek bed. They go into the woods. They follow the sound, and they see this little guy. And his exact words, he said, there was this little guy up there in the tree. And he said that on my horse, I could almost touch his foot, but it was like squinching itself into a ball. And he said that it almost fell. And so he thought, well, maybe I could pull it down. He said it was real small. He said it was smaller than a domestic dog. He said that they got the idea to lasso it. And he said that they were afraid that it might hurt it when it hit the ground. But he said, no, they're pretty resilient, that it fell 
it just kind of popped back up and then it kind of tried to run around the tree and it got wrapped around the tree. And then eventually he said that they subdued it and it bit one of them pretty bad on his arm. And he said that they had real sharp teeth, like razor sharp teeth. And he said that these things have teeth sharper than any dog you could imagine. He's like, it's unreal. So he said that they got it under control. He said they managed to tie its arms, but he goes, the, the horse was rearing and kicking. What nothing to do with it. So they got this burrow. And he said that they tied him behind her and they just had him follow along and that it had a really hard time walking on just two legs. He said that it kept wanting to get down on all fours. And he said that this thing had big oversized paws, paw feet, as he said. He said he looked almost like a rabbit. The feet were too big, their back feet. And he said that they kind of grow into their feet. That's what he said. They have these really big oversized paws. So anyway, he said that they got it back to the house and that it was terrified. They, they stuck it in one of the barns and that it just went and sat in the corner and whimpered all night. And it wouldn't eat. He tried to feed it. It wouldn't eat. And he said that eventually his wife got the idea to uh, soak bread in milk and give it to it. Then it ate. It ate the milk bread. And then it drank milk, too. And he said that after they got it to eat, he said that it started eating all the time. He said it was ravenous. This thing ate constantly. He said it was always hungry. And he said that he would feed it kibble. And eventually it got to where it would eat out of his hand. He said, I hand fed this thing. Now, this is what he told me. Okay. He said that they started feeding it slabs of beef. And he said that it ate everything. It would eat the offal. It would eat everything. You know, it didn't matter what part of the meat. It just, you could give it anything. It would eat it. He said it would chew bones. And he said the jaws were really strong, that they could snap through bone easy. And he said that this thing started growing. But one of the things he told me, though, he said he got worried because it had started to lose its hair. Another thing was that when he first brought it home, his dad tried to kill it. His dad grabbed the pitchfork and tried to impale it when he was just a little thing. He had to literally save its life. And he said that his dad almost killed him, almost stabbed him with it. He was so adamant about getting rid of it. Eventually, it started to lose its hair. And he said that it grew back some as it got older and got more my words, habituated is what I think. As it got more habituated, it began to get its hair back. He said, but its hair was still in patches, which is, I don't know what that is, stress or something. I don't know. And he said that they gave it a name. They called it Stripes. And I asked him about that, and he said that it had gray fur underneath its ears that came down into like a V on its chest. That's weird. He said that it was a very uh, unique pattern, like, you know, that he hadn't seen any others like that. And I asked him how many others had he seen, and he said that he had seen several because he would go deep into the woods and he would see them. He said that they would sometimes parallel him in the woods. And I was like, weren't you afraid? And he's like, no, I never had a real fear of them because they never attacked us. They never attacked me. And he said that that stemmed from the fact that he had heard all these stories but he said it killed the livestock and whatever, but it never really managed to kill many people. Now, it did kill some people. People died, like those guys that disappeared and then the guy that got drugged into the woods. But he said that, you know, he believed that if they really wanted to, they would have just killed everybody. And they didn't. So I guess his idea was that they do have some sense of, hey, this is not a good idea. So he says that they do hurt people. Now, Noah basically had told me what he thinks is that Abel's got this idealized version of him in his head. Is his exact words where he's delusional. But when I talked to Abel, Abel told me that that's not the case. He's like, Noah may think that, that I think that they're all good and everything. He's like, but they're not. I know they're not all good. He's like, there's a lot of them that are really bad. He's like, but it's like people. There's good ones and there's bad ones. So I guess Noah looks at them as animals and Abel kind of looks at them as people. <laughs> You know, or it gives them more of a persona, you know. And he said that Stripes grew to be a little bigger than a man by the time they let him go. Or that he forced him to go. He said he literally had to carry him into the woods and try to make him. But that he kept hanging around near the property. And his dad hated him. He didn't like him. He didn't want anything to do with any of them. He thought that they were all bad, all completely evil. There was nothing good about them. That he said that one day that thing's going to kill you and eat you. And he said that obviously it didn't because I'm still here. And he said that periodically him and his wife would go to the edge of the woods and they would leave food for it. He didn't elaborate on what the food was, but he did say that sometimes his wife would bake stuff and take it out there. I don't know. It's weird. I mean, like, I guess he had a relationship with this thing. 
this thing became uh, like family to him because he referred to it as his boy. He says he was my boy, you know, and he goes, and, and I loved him and he loved me. We were friends. One time he said that he was walking through this trail where there was this barn that was kind of the halfway point where they would keep hay. And it was, that's all it was, just a storage <laughs> barn for hay. That's all it was. And he said that uh, it started to rain. So he had ducked into this little corner of the barn, whatever, to get out of the rain. And he said he had this little transistor radio in his pocket, a little uh, radio. He turned it on and he heard this crackling, popping noise and he thought it was coming from the radio. And then he realized that he knew what that was. It was one of these things. So he clicked the radio off and he heard it like something moving in the hay. And then he heard a growling noise and he turns and he looks and he sees this dark brown female. And he said that he knows it was a female. He could tell he, at this point, you know, he had been around him enough. And he was like, oh, no, I'm in trouble now because the only one, I guess, that he was really friendly with was Stripes. That was it. The other ones, he didn't know anything about them, you know, and he said that I didn't know anything about these other ones. And he said that he heard whimpering, like he had woke up, you know, when puppies wake up or something, and he heard this whimpering, crying, and he heard like several puppies crying. And he said, oh, no, there's a female in here with puppies. I'm in big trouble. And he said that just then he heard something else come around the back of the barn or whatever. He said that it sounded like heavy, heavy footsteps. And he thought there must be a large male with this thing. And he said she was like staring at him, growling, but she wasn't in like pounce mode yet. And then he said that when that thing came out of the back of the barn, it was still daylight. He goes, but you couldn't see clearly. He's like, but sure enough, I saw the pattern of my boy. I saw his chest and I knew it was him. And he thought, oh my God, I'm saved. So he said that he came up to where he was at, got in between him and the female, got her to back off. And I didn't ask to go into details about how that went down. He just said that it basically uh, got in between him and this other female that was angry. And he said that there was a small one kind of trawling behind it, you know, like hanging on his leg. And he said that it, it looked like a little miniature version of him. And he said that I knew at that point that they had babies. And he just kind of slowly backed away and got out of there, you know, and he said that he walked as slow and as careful as you can. He said, the only thing you can do when you're cornered by these things is just to back away. He's like, there's nothing else you can do, you know. And so he said that after that initial contact with the female, he said that eventually she became kind of acclimated to him, too, that every now and then he would see her, the pups around as they grew. And he said, that, you know, they look just like wolves, but they can stand up. You know, that's what he said. But they have human looking shoulders. And I asked him what he thought they were, because Noah thinks they're just wolves or just wolves that mimic people. As he says, they learned how to walk or whatever. He says monkeys can mimic people. You know, and I say, yeah, but wolves aren't primates. But Abel says that he thinks that they're just like people. You know, he says they're just like another tribe of people. And that's what he calls them. He calls them a tribe. He doesn't call them a pack. Like me, if I refer to wolves, I, I refer to them as a pack. He's calling these things a tribe, which is giving them more human characteristics, like saying that they're like Native American tribes or something. And one of the things that he told me, like he said, this thing grew fast. Like when he had it, he said that it grew really, really quickly. And I thought it was interesting, you know, that this thing, he fed it dog food for a long time, you know? But it would also eat people food. And then he said that these things would eat berries. He gave it all kinds of different stuff. He said that it would eat anything. It was pretty much an omnivore, according to him. Now, I don't know if they're like that in the wild, but I know that the one he had that he, I guess, for lack of a better term, domesticated, did eat different types of food. He said that he would give them all kinds of stuff. And sometimes it would eat vegetables. And I didn't ask him to elaborate on what kind of vegetables it ate, but he said that it would eat fruit, it would eat vegetables, you know, it ate all kinds of meat. And he said that it would eat dog food, whatever you gave it, it would eat it. He said that sometimes it would be kind of leery of a new food, but that if it watched him eat it, then it would eat it too. And that's funny because my own dogs do that. I thought about that. Like if my dogs see me eating celery or something, something that they never eat, they'll want some. And then they'll put it in their mouth and they might chew it. And I've gotten them to eat grapes. So I'm thinking, I don't know if that's the canine side. I don't know what that is. It's just weird. It's a weird phenomenon. And so anyway, over the years, I guess this thing, he thinks that eventually this thing went back to its original tribe. And he thinks that it took over. It took control. He goes, because 
until Stripes got big and had pups, I guess, with this female, apparently, that there was still predation happening to the cattle. And sometimes one of their dogs, because he said that they have really big, strong Spanish mastiffs, mastines, with spike collars they use to patrol the property. And according to him, he said these things, they would get with those dogmen. You know, he didn't call them dogmen, he called them wolves. But he said that four of those things could get on one of those dogmen. He said because those big old collars kept their necks, you know, and these dogs. I used to have a mastiff. I had an English mastiff, not a Spanish one. But I know what he's talking about. They're huge. Mine was 130 pounds. It was, and it was like a really friendly pit bull. But once you keyed it up or sicked it on somebody, that was it. I mean, you know, they're toast. Those things are tough. I mean, I know the Romans used them to hunt lions, but he was telling me, he goes, I had some pretty tough dogs. He said, every now and then I'd lose one and they would go out into the woods and they would chase something and then they wouldn't come back. You know, he said, but he said that they were pretty good at fighting these things or keeping them away from the house, doing their job, basically defending the property. He said that he had one named Maggie and that it became really close to this dog man that he had acclimated to people and that he was really close to her. And she treated him almost like a mama. And when he had gotten her to be cool with him, it kind of followed her around. And that was like his mother, which I thought was interesting that he had this dog that was like his pal. And then she had a litter and one of the pups in that litter who turned out to be the runt actually became Stripe's buddy. And when he finally kicked him out, whatever, that dog ran off and went to go hang out with him in the woods. And so he said that I don't know whatever became of him, but he basically <laughs> took off and was his friend. <laughs> Pretty interesting. Just listening to this guy talk about this gave me a better understanding of the dynamics of these things. And I'm not saying that it's like that everywhere you go, but that tells me a little bit about these things, you know, like they're not just mindless killing machine beasts, you know, like we, I guess at one point, I, I should say, not we, but I guess I thought at one point that they're just a bunch of killers roaming around the woods that could just kill you on sight. And I guess I had that thought because I was afraid of them. So anyways, what ended up happening, he said that he hadn't seen Stripes in a long, long time. I asked him about that. When was the last time he had seen him? And he said that one day he was out in the woods and he heard all this fighting, snapping, and he ran back to the house because it scared him. And he said it took a lot for him to be afraid, but he knew something had happened. He said that he thinks that that was the point where Stripes went back and took over. Now, you know, when you piece it together, and he didn't tell me this, but this is what I think. I think that one that he domesticated, I think that his dad might have been the alpha or something. And I think he got deposed. And I think that the mother was probably trying to protect him or save him. And maybe he had siblings that got wiped out too, because lions do that. The new male comes in and it'll kill the cubs and try to mate with the female. If the females resist, then they'll kill the female. And so when Abel, and I should probably tell you this part, I think I forgot it. When Abel found that female, he said that it looked like it had been chewed up. It was dead. It was killed, I should say. Not just like it died of natural causes. He said that it had been chewed up. So I'm thinking the other members of the pack tore up, probably trying to protect her cubs. She wasn't willing to breed. I don't know. I don't know how that works. I don't know enough about these things to give you a good answer to that. But this is what Abel was kind of telling me. And that's what I was able to glean from his story, that that's what happened. And that's what I believe, too, that this probably the case. That was why he was hiding in the tree or whatever, you know. And so according to what Abel told me, he went back and assumed control of the tribe because he said that Stripes was a big boy and that he was well over eight feet. The one that I saw was seven foot, five inches. And I know that because we measured from the floor to the window. But according to him, this thing was over eight feet tall. This is some of the questions I asked him, you know, and he told me that it was huge. You know, he said that it was a good foot taller, at least over the female that it ran around with. And he said that the pups grew. And that some of them looked like the dad and that he said that sometimes he would see one and think, oh, that's Stripes. No, that's not. That's one of his kiddos. And they were OK with him, too, you know, because they would go out to that barn and they would leave food periodically, you know. And he said that there was no problems, no aggression, nothing after that initial encounter from the female. He said that when they were real young, he kind of stayed away until they got a little older, you know, a little bigger so she wouldn't be as protective. And so that's the story about that. So what ended up happening, 
according to him, the last time he saw Stripes was well over 10 years ago. And that he looked really old. He saw him walking on this ridge line, and he said that he had a couple of the other ones with him and that he looked like he was hobbling, like that was it for him, you know. And he said that he doesn't know the whole dynamics or how it works either, you know. He just knows that shortly after the last time he saw him, he said that the predation started back up, that they started losing dogs. And he said that here lately, it's gotten really bad. I mean, he's, he's, they're having all kinds of problems. He said all of the cats are gone. He said he's lost most of his dogs and he's lost some cows. And he said that a couple of the cows were just killed outright. They weren't even eaten. They just got slaughtered. So he says that his brother and Shane's younger brother, who I actually know is a real dumb, <laughs> that they had gone out there to try to bag one of these things. Now, this happened back in the fall. Now, I haven't talked to JoJo since like September. So. I don't know what has transpired with this guy or whatever between the fall and now. But apparently they had gone out there and they shot one of these things. And he said this happened back in the fall. This is what Abel and Noah both told me. And that after they shot it, a bunch of stuff started happening. The thing about what JoJo did is that he doesn't live out there. So he goes out there and gets together with Cody, which is Shane's younger brother, who's really interested in killing one of these things they want to kill it put it on youtube and show the world hey look this is what is out here which is so stupid and those old timers don't want anything to do with the government or anybody coming out there to their property and noah was very adamant he said if somebody comes out to my property i'm gonna shoot them i don't play around you know and now abel didn't say nothing like that he just said that you know he, he they've had the government out there before some guys came out there from fort sam looking around and tried to come on the property and they made them leave now, he said that he knows that the sheriff's department, they've been out there, too, because the guy that works for the sheriff's department, his grandfather knew his dad, and he knew Shane's grandfather and everybody. So his dad was a cop, and so he says that they knew about these things going way back when all that stuff was happening back in the 30s. They would come to the property. Oh, nothing they could do. I mean, what are they going to do? They can't do nothing about these things. He said they know they exist. But he thinks that maybe some of the local law enforcement had tipped off somebody in the military, and that's why they came nosing around. I don't know what to think about that. That's a whole other thing. But they're real worried about people messing around out there or whatever, coming out to their property. And I know that when Joseph and Cody shot one of these things, and Abel seems to think they killed it. He said, but they don't allow their dead to stay for very long. He says, if one of them's dead. He goes, and you get to go up and get a good look at it. It's going to be gone soon. You have a very short window for these things. You know, and I've heard that with Sasquatch, too, that supposedly, you know, one of them dies. I had this lady that lives up in Oregon. She was telling me, she's like, one of them died, and it was, like, in the back by this creek behind their house. And it was only there for a little while, and then it was gone. Well, I'm pretty sure these things do the same thing. They grab their dead. <sighs> do they bury them? I have no idea. I, I, you know, I don't know anything about that. That is just so much weirdness for me to even contemplate. You know, I don't even know what they could possibly do with them, but I know that they don't allow people to take them. So he said that, you know, this one that they shot, they used a 50 caliber. And so they can be killed. And Abel and Noah were very adamant about that because I told them that people would shoot these things periodically and that nothing would happen to them. Like they were impervious to bullets and they both laughed, both of them. You know, and I wasn't talking to him at the same time. You know, I was talking to him separately. And Abel, you know, he was like, that's bull. He goes, you can kill anything. If it bleeds, it dies. He goes, and these things are just creatures just like we are. He says God's creatures. That's his opinion. I understand that. But he says they're just God's creatures like we are. He goes, they bleed, they die, they get old, they get sick. And Noah, he claims that they know good and well what a gun is because, and I'll get back to his other encounter. One of the counters he had, he was out in the woods hunting rabbits and one of these things popped up behind a log and he said he heard that popping noise he heard that you know noise the way he made it with his i can't do it but he he said that it, it, you know he heard it and he looked and he sees one just growling standing right there and he said that he pointed his rifle at it and it ducked down between some trees and he said that these things are smart they know exactly what that gun is capable of he says and i use incendiary rounds he goes because fire works best so he said that he uh, had actually popped one of them in the shoulder one time, he thinks, by accident. 
but he didn't even get a good look at it. He just heard a yelp. They were playing around near an area where they go and they shoot, and he thinks one of them might have been sleeping close to the wood line, and that they just started firing into the woods, and he heard like a yelping noise. And he also claimed that he heard a wild boar. He thinks there's a big male boar out there that they killed that was near 700 pounds, Vic. Now, these things get huge because I know in my hometown, somebody killed one, and get this, that was near Granger Lake, where I'm from, 900 pounds, 900 pounds. Now, I saw the pictures, and I know the guy that did it. So this really happened. This is no fairy tale. It was almost 900, it was 890 pounds. So these things get really big. He said they had a really big male boar out there, and he thinks that one of those younger ones got tore up by it because – he heard uh, a, a growling, howling, whatever, and then he heard one of these hogs out there, and he said that they were just going to war, like they were fighting. And he said that he heard like a, yep, 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 you know how dogs, when they get injured, you know. And he thinks that this boar may have uh, gored this thing to death because he said that they would see that hog around periodically. It was a wild boar. Here in Texas, they're everywhere. Adam told him there's a dead one out there by the tree line. And he said that, yeah, I heard it getting into a fight with that big boar that we got on the property. So anyway, he said that this thing became a big problem. So they went out and they decided to kill it. And he said that this thing not only had killed that dog man, but it had also badly gored a couple of their dogs. And that this thing was just a, a mutant, you know. So eventually he said that they bagged it. They killed it. 680 pounds. That's a big boy. And he said that it was mean, that it was head was so, he said it looked prehistoric, this thing that they killed. He said, i never seen a, a hog look like that. It was just deformed looking. It was mean, you know. It was funny because I told him, I said, I'd heard stories of these hogs getting really big. And there was one that they called Hogzilla, you know. He said, well, he's like, this thing looked like Godzilla. <laughs> he's like, it was horrible, you know. And he said that they, they knew that if this thing could get with one of those wolves, that it would make short work of a person. And so they were like, we got to do something. You know, we had kids out here and stuff. And so they had to get rid of it, you know. And so they went after it. But the thing about it that strikes me is just the level of intelligence that these things have. I had always heard, oh, they're, they're smart, they're smart, you know, but it, it just it just blows my mind, like how smart they can really be. You know, like when I hear stories, people tell me, about them turning doorknobs and unscrewing light bulbs and communicating. And when people are out in the woods and, and how they get followed by them and they feel like they're being flanked. And it's just, it's so scary to think of something that deadly and that intelligent. It's no wonder that our government, and our military are trying to figure out what they are. If they don't already know, I'm sure they know they exist, but they're probably wanting to, to figure it out. You know, now I got friends that believe that they're government experiments themselves. I don't know. But I think that the fact that these things have been around for as long as they have, I think that that kind of closes the book on that. Now, maybe they have gotten some of them. And that's why we have the different types. Now, I don't know a lot about the different types. I know that you have that theory about the different types or whatever. But I don't know. Every time I think I found an answer to something, there's more questions that pop up. So, yeah, in the fall, Joseph and Shane's stupid brother uh, went out there and, and shot one of them. He said that now it's gotten really bad. He thinks that it's going to start a whole new level of violence that's going to take place. Abel seems to think that there are two big ones that are in charge now. And uh, he said that they're reddish brown in color, which makes sense because that's what Shane had told me. The one that attacked him was reddish brown. And he said that they're two big males. He thinks they're brothers. And that they may actually be descendants of the one that he caught because the mother was a reddish brown one. But he said that he doesn't know. He has no idea. And he said that that big black one that Joseph killed, he said that was a huge mistake. And he said, I know why he did it, because, you know, the one that attacked him in the house, he said that that thing, he thinks because they had shot at one of them before, he said that he thinks that that thing stalked him out there to that property he was working on. And that that's why it went into the house. He said it went into the house to kill him. That's what he said. He really believed that. And he said that that uh, Jojo going out there and, and shooting at the first one he saw was a big mistake because he said that the one that he thinks that the one that attacked him in the house when he was working on the cabinets, I don't know if you remember that story from episode 116, but he said that that one had to have been a big male because it had to have been like eight, nine feet tall. He said it was huge. And he said that that black, there's a black one that's bigger than the two brothers that's, 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 that he thinks is either kind of like rogue. It's kind of on its own or whatever. 
like he got cast out or something, or maybe it's subordinate to those two reddish brown ones. He doesn't know. He said he thinks it's a real young one that has just grown into its, you know, whatever its prime. And um, he said that the one that they went out there and shot back in the fall was a female. And he said that that was a huge mistake doing that. And he said that he thinks that a whole new series of events is about to take place. Now, unfortunately, when Abel was talking to me, his interview that I gave him was sandwiched between two other calls that I and I, and I was falling asleep. I was really tired and it was early for me because I had to be up all night the night before. And so when we were talking, I actually fell asleep at the end of the conversation. Unfortunately, I feel bad about it. But I didn't get to finish listening to his story about he was telling me about one of his encounters with these things and he was giving me information. Very uh, polite, articulate, educated guy, very friendly. And so he, like I said, was a real contrast to his brother Noah. He didn't give me a bunch of other stuff, you know, that I had to sift through and pick out like vegetables in a garden. I just was able to talk to the guy and get to the point. And he told me everything that he had. And he was just talking. And and I told him, well, I'll call you tomorrow. And then he said, no, I'm, I'm packing tomorrow to go to Lubbock. My daughter's getting remarried, whatever. So I have not been able to get back with him. And I debated about maybe trying to finish interviewing him before I got in touch with you. But I was like, you know what? I want to get these stories out there while they're fresh. So there may be more from him anyway, because I didn't get all of the uh, encounters or whatever. I know that there was one other story where uh, Noah was walking along a tree line where there were dewberries. Now, they're called blackberries, but here in Texas, they grow wild and we call them dewberries. So him and his wife were picking dewberries and he heard some snapping noises in the woods, like some twigs snapping. So Noah said he pointed his rifle and he heard whatever it was kind of jog away. That was his words. So that tells you the level of intelligence these things have just to see a gun. And he didn't even see the thing. He just knew that it was there. Usually he says that this, the leveling of a rifle is enough to make them back off. He said, but the old timers claim that when they attack you, they'll attack you from behind. And this is what Noah said that was very intriguing. And I've wondered this, Vic, and I, I don't know the answer, but this is this is what I think is is the, is the deal. And I think that, you know, that when he was telling me this, I think he's right. Okay? And I'll tell you what he said. He said that the people that see these things face on, he said they don't attack like that. He said they'll bluff charge you. He said, but what they'll do is they'll melt into the woods and then they'll attack you from the side or they'll grab you from behind and bite the back of your neck. And he said that that's how they attack their prey. And I said, how do you know that? He said, because you, the old timers said that. They watched them attack cows. They watched them attack horses. They killed horses. They slaughtered dogs. He's like, that's how they did it. He said, and there were people that were killed too. And now he told me this. He said, there's several bodies buried on this property. He goes, I can tell you that right now with certainty, you know, from the old days, from that whole episode that went on, you know, back in those days. So, I think that's true. I think that when people see them head on, you know, and I'm not saying this is the whole case, so don't take my word. And then somebody gets attacked and like, well, Wolf said you can just stare. No, no, please don't do this, ladies and gentlemen. Please do not think that you're safe just because you see them head on. But I, I think it's like that, though. There's They're ambush predators, dude. I think that that's what they do. I think that when you run into one by itself, according to what Abel told me, he thinks that or not uh, Abel Noah, he said that it, they're like it's like a scout. Or it could be a rogue, you know, because he's like, they're usually not alone. He's like, see, you run in with one by itself and you see it. He's like, it's probably not alone. He said, but if it is, then it's probably just like scouting around. You know, it's like they send one out to go look reconnaissance, I guess. And uh, he said that they tend to be uh, attacked from behind predators because getting hurt. And this is my words, but getting hurt in nature could cost you your life. I mean, you know, they get injured by a knife or a gun or something, bacterial infection sets in, they're dead. And they don't have antibiotics. A Bigfoot or a dogman or whatever, you know, a wolf, a dog, whatever that lives wild. And there's no coming back from an injury. A lot of times that's it. You just die. But according to what Abel told me, and I asked him about that later, I got his opinion, which they're differing opinions, differing school of thoughts about everything. And Abel said that he believes that they heal really quickly. Because he said that there was one that lived out on the property and only had one paw. Its front paw was gone, like it had been chopped off. And he said that he would see it and that it would hop around on three legs and then it would get up and run around on two legs. He said that its front forearm or forepaw, whatever, was gone. 
he said that that one was a gray one. And he said that that's the one, they call it the chicken killer, that it goes into the chicken coops and raids the chicken coops and that it eats eggs and stuff. So that's weird. I mean, you know, like he told me about that. So, you know, this thing actually lost its paw. And I've seen stories or heard stories of bears or whatever having like one paw. I've never actually seen it, but I've heard of it happening and being able to survive. But it's very rare that an animal will lose a limb or have an injury and just be able to recover fully and live. So there's that. I don't know, Josh. It sounds like a great place not to live to me. Yeah. And you know what? I was talking to my friend about that. We were talking about these guys, my friend who's the Bigfoot researcher, and we were talking about the different people that we talked to and how it's crazy because how do these people stay living on these properties? I look at it like this. I lived in a house that had a lot of paranormal activity that took place when I was younger. It didn't happen all the time. It was like sometimes it was there, sometimes it wasn't. And most of the time, it was a very nice, peaceful place to live, and I liked living there. Stuff went on. I'm not even going to get into stuff. I don't want to go there. That's a whole other deal. But it didn't happen all the time. And I guess that affected other people worse than it did me. So I guess it was just one of those things. You know, these guys grew up there from the time that they were boys, the little boys. They were born there, raised there, their whole lives. So I guess that's all they know that it's become normal to them. The only time that Noah ever deviated from his life there was when he went away to war. So that ain't like a good experience. It's not like he's going to go, wow, I had such a great time overseas. I think that I need to expand my horizons. No, the only time he ever left was to do a horrible job that he was forced into, you know? So it's home to them. It's home. That's all they know, you know? And uh, one other thing I was going to tell you, there was one story that I knew about Andrew. And this is from his son, Jerry, Abel and Noah. They all pretty much told me the same thing about him. They said that the reason that Andrew doesn't talk about any of these things is because he was taken, for lack of a better word, I guess, kidnapped. They said that he was swiped, taken, whatever, by one of these things and that it kept him. It kept him out in the woods and that he was playing with a smaller one when he was little. He would always wander off, you know, like always head in the clouds is what Abel said. And that he wandered off too close to the wood line and was playing with one of these little ones and that it lured him into the woods. Well, his words, that it lured him. And that this female took him and tried to, like, just hold him. And he said that when he came back, he told the story. And then he never would talk about it again, ever in his whole life. He never spoke of it again. And he would never talk about it. Never, they, He never wanted to bring it up. He was one of the people that was never okay with Stripes being on the property. He was never okay with it. And and one of the things that Abel and his wife, his wife died a few years ago. She died of cancer. I wish I could have talked to her. But he said that him and his wife continued to have relations with Stripes and that sometimes they would lay food out on the edge of the property and that sometimes a head of cattle would get taken and that this is weird. He believes Stripes was the one doing it, would leave a deer carcass like in exchange. You see what I'm saying? Like trading. <laughs> And, uh, you know, Andrew, he's Jerry and them's dad. He was against the uh, acclimation of this thing being, you know, he didn't like it being around. He never trusted it. He had always told Jerry and them to be careful from these things. And I don't know what happened. If he got taken and this thing let him go, then I guess they're not all bad. Noah seems to think that Abel has this, he's deluded to think that they're okay. But Abel says that he's under no illusions. He's like, there's good ones and there's bad ones. And he goes, and I know that I had a good one. I know in my heart he was a good guy. But these other ones, he goes, I don't trust them. I don't even trust his the ones that he had as pups. He goes, I don't know them. You know, I knew them when he was around. I was safe. But I don't believe that they won't hurt you. He's like, I don't believe that you can just be completely safe from anything that's a large predator. And I understand that. People in Africa live around hyenas and lions. They're there. They can kill you. It happens sometimes. But what do you do? I mean, there's nothing you can really do. You just got to keep your eyes and ears open. People that live in America, in a, in a city in particular, there's no way. I mean, you have people that are criminals that are bad. You got to watch out. But the odds of it are so, it's like, dude, you're dealing with 
civilization. You're out in the wild, dude. Anything that's out there can just kill and eat you, and you have to understand that. And I guess these guys living in the middle of nowhere, that's what happens. I mean, you know, it's like a daily thing for them. They don't have any uh, illusions. They know that when they go out that they can maybe not come back. I can't imagine living like that. I couldn't do it. There's no way I could do it. I mean, I saw one one time, and that was all it took, you know. But I guess if you've grown up with it and you've been taught about it since you were babies, you know, I guess that their whole perception is just completely different. One other thing I was going to tell you, too, I was told that every once in a while they would get these weird, like, little gifts that would be left on the property that looked like, to them, it looked like sticks tied together with, like, gut. And they would be in weird shapes, like snowflake-looking things, you know? I don't know. And they don't know what it is, like, if, if that's their way of giving you a gift, like a decoration or what, what it stands for or what it was. But they they do believe that, that those things are from the dogmen, from the wolves, as they call them. I was going to tell you a funny story. And I know I told you in the pre-interview. Back in, in January, they had a quinceanera out there. Now, my mother is Mexican, and I know, I know how it goes. And Noah's a real funny guy, man. He's really, really a funny guy. But he was saying that his primo, his cousin, told him, you know, hey, man, let us come out there and have the big party out there at your house. Get that big ranch. And he told him, because Abel had already told him no. And so he said, no, you know. And he kept, you know, being real pushy. So he goes, one night we got to drinking. And so I said, okay, fine come out to the property. You can bring him out. He goes, but I got to warn you. He goes, we got these wolves out here. And his cousin just kind of laughed because I guess the ones that live in town, they don't really all, the way it seems to me is that they don't grasp the enormity of the real problem. So I don't know if those are the right words, (laughs) but it just seems like to me that they're not getting it. Even the ones that seem to know, because Noah said that some of them do know, you know, because we talked about that. But he said that they had a quinceanera out there for his uh, great niece. So anyway, he said that about midnight, he was starting to get really tired. He said that the whole woods, I guess, because they were out, in the, you know, being loud. He said that they just erupted with howls. And he said that him and his brother, Joseph, they knew exactly what it was. And they just kind of looked at each other and smiled. And he said that it was so loud and it, and it was so persistent. Eventually, everybody just kind of stopped dancing, stopped partying, and was just sitting there listening to it. He said that it was echoing. It was scary. And he said that he's heard it before. He's used to it. He said that if you took like 50 wolves and had them howl at one time, that's what it sounded like. And he said that it was just so loud and that that everybody was just kind of like stopped. And he said that uh, everybody just had this stunned look on their face like they were waiting for something to happen. And then he said, okay, folks, party's over. And he told them, he goes, I was so glad that it interrupted everybody's festivities so he could, like, go to sleep. And uh, he said that his one cousin, she told him, she goes, man, you got a lot of coyotes out on the property. And he's like, those aren't coyotes. And she's like, what are they? He goes, you don't want to know. And then, and she just kind of gave him a puzzled look. And then he went inside and went to sleep and everybody left. So I guess that's the upside. If you got relatives over and you want them to leave, well, you know, the wolves ran them off. Yeah, that would definitely do it. And I don't know, Josh, the idea of keeping a domesticated dog man around the property, that just creeps me out. Yeah, I don't know how he could do it. But another point to that, supposedly, and this is what Noah had told me, and so I asked Abel about it, that dog man saved his life. It saved him from a fire because this is what Abel said. He used to drink a fifth of Jack every day. He had a drinking problem real bad because he had had a wife that actually had passed away before the one that he ended up being married to for a long, long time. I guess he said he got married when he was 19 and that she had a car accident. And then he got remarried in his early 20s, and I guess that was the one that became really close with that dog man. So he developed a drinking problem, and I guess one night his wife, she would leave periodically to go out of town or whatever. I don't know what she did, but he said that that, uh, whenever she wasn't around, he would get real depressed. This is what Noah said, actually. And he said that he was uh, codependent, basically. If he didn't have his wife around, he felt like he would get real depressed. And so this was years after, and he thinks that he was pining over his first wife, which he never got over, supposedly. This is Noah telling me this. But he said that he would drink 
himself into a, a stupor. And Abel confirmed that. He said, yeah, before I found Jesus, before I found God, I, I drank a lot and I would imbibe regularly. And that's his exact words. Like I said, he's a pretty articulate guy, but he said that I used to smoke a cigar and I would drink whiskey and that one night I fell asleep. And he said earlier that day, he had seen his boy, as he called them, the stripes, looking through the window at him. And he said that he had taught him how to wave. Now, I don't know if that's true or if he was just pulling my leg, but he said he could wave. You know, he would like acknowledge him. And he saw him looking in the window and he just kind of waved at him and he fell asleep. Now, there was a fire. He doesn't remember anything. He just remembers waking up outside of the house that was burned down. And this was the house that he had built that, that was behind their ancestral boyhood home that his dad, Adam, had built. And he eventually moved into that main house or whatever because his older brother, Adam, had moved further off and built another plot. Now what he's living in is essentially their boyhood home. He has that house. It's just him there now. He's a widower or whatever. And so he believes, and Noah believes it too, that Stripe saved his life, that he saw him fall asleep and the fire started. He took him and brought him out of it. I don't know. <laughs> I mean, maybe if uh, he wouldn't have uh, acclimated that dog man to humans, he wouldn't be alive right now to be even interviewed about it. Just about the only thing I can think of that's creepier than having a domesticated dog man around your property is having a dog man around your property that can wave at you. <laughs> I'm telling you, man. I couldn't even imagine that, dude. And, you know, he's got two sons, and I guess one of them works in the oil fields and the other one is a military life or whatever. But he said that his sons got to know these critters, too. He said that one of his sons had a relationship not too unsimilar to the one he had with Stripes with one of the females that was younger generation. So I don't know. He said that when he was younger, his son gave one of them a baseball. He don't know what he did with it. But he just said that he gave him a baseball. And I was like, did they play with it? Or he goes, I don't know. He goes, you'd have to ask my son about that. But <laughs> weird, man. Weird, wild stuff. Yeah, that is awfully weird. And if JoJo started a war with them all over again, that's not good. No, not at all. Yeah, I don't know why he'd want to do that. Did Noah ever say if he was afraid of Stripes, even though Stripes never heard him? It sounds to me like he was. Yeah, he didn't like them. That's one thing Noah did say. He said, I don't give a d If these wolves can do tricks, dance, he goes, I don't care. He goes, I don't like them. I don't trust them. He said that he would see his brother out there, like, giving him food or whatever, and he was just like, what a fool. What a fool. And he, he thinks that one of those that he raised the rifle at might have been Stripes or one of his people or whatever. But he said that he didn't care. He's like, I told my brother, you know, that if that thing comes near me, I'm going to shoot it. You know, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. Of course, he was overseas. He was in Vietnam when all this was going on. So he comes back and there's like this dog man that they had befriended or whatever. And he never saw it. There were pictures of it. Well, I should say picture because when I asked Abel about it, he said that there was a photo. But of course, there was a fire. So he lost everything he owned, you know, but he said that According to him, sometimes he would go out into the woods and he would play his guitar and he knew that they were around listening, that they liked it. <laughs> when I told Noah that, Noah was like, he's a fool. He's an old fool, man. He's like, one of these days he's going to get eaten by one of those things. He's going to know what I'm talking about. But to me, Noah has not had a lot of interaction with these things. So what does he really know? I mean, all he knows is he doesn't like these things. He doesn't like them on the property. And he said that if he could, he would kill them all. So that's his take on it. That's how he feels. Abel doesn't feel that way. Abel feels like, you know, there's peace. If you leave them alone, they leave you alone. Like he said, he's like, I'm pushing 80 and I'm still alive. And I've had lots of interactions with these things. He's like, if they were really all that bad, as Noah paints the picture, you know, that they are, He's like, we'd all be dead. And he said, he's like anything else. He goes, you can take a bear or a cougar and you can domesticate it. He said, I had a friend that had a mountain lion that was domesticated and she was just like a house cat, just bigger. You know, he goes, it just depends. He said, and there's good ones and there's bad ones. You know, it's like that with animals. It's like that with people. It's like that with everything. And I know he's right about that because I've seen like Shark Week or whatever. 
I mean, I'm not a big fan of that, but I mean, I've seen some of the shows where people will get in there and touch these sharks and there's sharks, I think that are used to people and that's fine, you know, but I mean, you'll never see me doing that. Heck no, dude. I know that there was some guy that my friend was telling me about that had a crocodile that he swam with and he said it's on YouTube. I've never actually looked it up. I saw something about it briefly on TV, but I can't give you the exact info, but I know that it exists. There's some sort of, because I've heard more than one person say it, a guy that would swim around with a crocodile, and he was friends with it for years and years and years. I don't know how that happens. I have no idea how that happens. But you got to figure, if somebody can befriend a bear, a cougar, a crocodile, and have a relationship with it, then why not one of these things, I guess? I don't know, man. I know this. My friend had two tarantulas. It wasn't really his. It was his uh, girlfriend's. but they were tame. I mean, he would take them and play with them and whatever. But if you try to touch them or even move toward them, they would rear up and they scared the crap out of me. And he would take them out when we'd be hanging out, you know, or whatever with, with friends. And he would like scare people with them, but they knew him. They knew him. They did. And they never bit him or anything. And he had their little cage or whatever it was, a little uh, plastic thing, they, the, the aquarium that they sat in. And it was right on his headboard above his head where he slept, dude. Oh God. <laughs> I'm just going like, are you crazy, Paul? That's just, uh, oh, man. I mean, that's just horrible to think about because I hate spiders. But it didn't bother him, you know. And he said once or twice they got out and he would just pick them up and put them back in. And they were just as calm as Hindu cows with him. But to anybody else that just moved their hand toward them, they'd rear up with their big old fangs showing. And I'm like, oh, are you crazy? How can you trust that thing, you know? But <laughs> I guess it's the same principle i don't know i know what you mean it's hard to understand why anybody would want to sleep with two tarantulas up on their headboard like that the idea of that makes the hair of my butt stand up <laughs> i tell you what dude i don't know i might rather deal with a dog man than a tra- <laughs> i really have arachnophobia dude like i do not like spiders and i remember that last interview when me and you were talking It got edited out, but there was a spider. Remember, I had to stop and kill it, dude. I was sitting there in my office doing the interview, and it's like there's a spider, and I had to stop. Do you remember that? I do remember Uh, that. Crazy. So, you know, it was like, I mean, I'm laughing about it now, but it wasn't funny at the time. It was like, dude, you know. And, and you know, it wasn't that big, but to me, it might as well have been an African bird spider. It was small, but it was like, to me, any, any of them are giant tarantulas ready to eat me. You know, I just, I don't like them. For certain things I'm afraid of. I don't like lightning. I don't like spiders. You know, I don't like sharks. And I don't like dogmen. And even if this guy had one that was right there and he was like serving us dinner, I wouldn't trust it. You know what I mean? (laughs) Sitting there being friendly and talking. I still wouldn't trust it because it's a wolf, dude. I know exactly what you mean. Did Abel ever say how old Stripes would have been when he saw it that last time up on the ridge? No. No, I didn't get a time on that. And, you know, that's also my fault, sloppy interviewing, because I was starting to get sleepy, and I was starting to kind of nod at that point. And I really should have gotten a time, because I tried to kind of piece it together, and I just didn't get it. That would have been nice to know, though. And that may be something that I get from him, maybe more information, and maybe not enough for another show, but maybe I can give it to you, and you can post it on the Dogman Facebook or However you want to do that, maybe I can give you that information. Because he was in the middle of trying to tell me about an encounter he'd had, and I was falling asleep because he was at that point just talking. and I was so tired, and I apologize about that. God. I kicked myself. I should have stayed awake. Oh, that's all right. Didn't do it on purpose. If you can get that info from him, that would be really good information to have because if we could have an idea how long these things live, that'd be pretty valuable. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, because to me, you know, and I'm taking a guess here. People don't. I'll probably get all kinds of comments. This guy don't know what he's talking about. Well, I don't because I'm no expert. So I'm throwing that out there as a disclaimer here. I would think that their lifespan is probably like longer than a regular canines, but shorter than a human's. Maybe. I wouldn't be surprised. Your mom recently told you about something she had never shared with you before. What did she tell you? Yes, yes. I recently took my adopted son with me to Tomball, and we went to go visit my mother. And 
I call him my adopted son because he's my uh, friend's son or whatever, and they don't speak, and he's been living with me for a long time. So I basically just call him my adopted son, you know, and I've known him since he was a little bitty boy. But uh, we went to go visit my mother, and she said something to us, and my friend Armando that I'm really, really close with, he lives in Tomball, (laughs) literally like right there close to my mother. And like I said, Armando's a Bigfoot researcher. And me and him talk about this stuff sometimes, you know, and, and so he came over and and we'd all eaten dinner and he came over and we were talking and he was telling my mom's friend, her son, who was asking questions about it. And Armando was telling them that he's kind of a, cause he's retired military, that he's kind of a researcher, like an amateur researcher of Bigfoot slash dog man like I am. You know, I'm kind of a researcher too, like, you know, amateur. It's not what I do for a living, but it's become kind of a hobby, I guess. I don't know. I really don't know what it is. It's just, I guess, like I said, a quest for answers. But my mother had said something to us that I never heard her say before ever because she had heard my encounter. You know, I told her when I was a teenager and she never wanted to talk about it again for whatever reason. But she said that when she was growing up, that she had always heard stories about werewolves in my hometown. Now, in my hometown, they call them werewolves. They don't call them wolves. They don't call them dog man. I don't even know what a dog man is. They call them werewolves. And like I said, there was a couple stories that I had heard, you know, and, and we didn't want to get into those because they were a little weird. But my mother said that when she was growing up, there was a creek down behind where she grew up called Mustang Creek. And on the other side of that, she would hear like weird howls at night and uh, her brothers and sisters would hear it. And people believed that these things were werewolves and that they existed in and around my town. Now, I'm not saying that the one I saw was a werewolf as a person transforming because I didn't see any kind of transformation. I still have never heard of anybody actually seeing that. But that's what she said. She said that all her life she had heard stories of werewolves. And I thought that was funny because my mother had never spoken up about that. She had never said that before, but she was comfortable enough with me and Armando there that she told us that. And uh, I thought that was interesting because she finally admitted, you know, that she knew about these things because for years she just wouldn't talk about it. She just didn't even acknowledge it. She would just make a face whenever it came up or anything, you know, and so at least she's leveling with me on that, (laughs) you know, and so, That was interesting. I wish she would have told you about that a long time ago instead of holding out on you. Yeah, and until the thing happened to me, and like she told me, she said until that it happened to me, she really didn't believe in it. She just thought that it was stories. But once you hear enough encounters and enough stories from one area, you start to think, well, there's got to be something to that. Where there's smoke, there's fire, right? I mean, you know, enough people have encounters and enough people see these things. It's not fiction, dude. It's got to be something to it, you know? When me and Armando had talked about the guys from the ranch or whatever, I believe these guys. I really do, you know, because it would be hard to get all these guys together to collaborate on a big lie to me, to get them to all be like, okay, you tell them this. We're going to get this sucker. He's going to believe all this. And what are we gaining out of that? You know what I mean? I just want to gather as much information and knowledge as possible. And I think that these things are encrypted, just like I think Bigfoot is. And I think at some point, we're going to have to come to terms with these things exist in our world. They're real. And people go out there, and you might run into some raccoons or coyotes or hogs or whatever, but you may run into one of these things too. And anybody who thinks that they're safe out in the woods because they got their gun, you're deluding yourself, dude. Noah's opinion about oh, I got my gun with me, I ain't worried, I'm, you know, whatever, and and that's going to keep you safe. Well, that's your blanket. In Spanish, we say cocha. You got your little security blanket, and you think that it's going to keep you safe. Well, you know, that may give you peace of mind, but peace of mind is not going to save your life. So, I don't care how big of a gun you've got. At any time out in the woods, these things could take you out at will, so that's no protection. A woman recently told you about a dog man that came into her house. What happened to her? And like we talked about earlier, Vic, there's people that have contacted me. And I, for the most part, don't mind it at all. I don't always have time to answer everybody. I know there's a lot of you guys out there listening that have sent me friend requests, things like that, you know. And and I don't always have a chance to, because I have a lot of things I have to deal with in my life. And 
don't be offended if I don't respond. I try to answer as many people as I can. But I did get and make friends with a, a couple of people through this whole research that I've been doing. And one of them, I'll call her Natalie. But Natalie told me this story that was pretty interesting. She had two dogmen encounters. And one in particular, she lives out in the Mojave Desert. And so she said that one day, one of these things came through the back door of her house and went into her room and was just sitting there looking at her and her two siblings. And they were just staring at it. And they stared at it and and they stared at them. And eventually, she told her sister, like she whispered to one of her sisters, she's like, we have to scream, you know, and, but, and they were counting to three and then they didn't scream. And then it just sat there just staring at them, you know, ears twitching, just looking at them, weird face. The way she described it was just a terrifying visage of this thing. So finally they screamed at the same time, all of them. And then it turned and bolted out the door. Just crazy, a crazy story. And then she said years later when she was like, I think she said she was like eight or nine when that happened. And then she said that when she was 17, she saw two of these things again. And it was just her and a group of friends. And that they were up on this ridge and they saw two of them cross the highway together. And they were both black, just like the first one she had seen. It was black. And she said that the two that crossed the highway, one was a good few inches taller than the other one. And she said that she thought it was a male and a female. When she was telling me this, of course, she was real nervous. She was afraid that I was going to think she was crazy or say something. And I'm like, you've heard me on Vic's show talking about all this stuff. I put myself out there to be, if somebody wants to think I'm nuts or they want to hurl whatever at me, I'm open because I'm sitting here telling these stories. I said, do you think I'm going to judge you for that? You know. So anyway, that was her encounter. It's just pretty crazy. Yeah, that is crazy stuff. It's bad enough having an encounter out in the woods, but when they come into your house and stand at the threshold of your bedroom, that takes it to a whole new level. Yeah, and that's something that has come up again and again in stories that I've heard. Like, I'm not going to get into the story, but, you know, there was the story from the girl from Serbia that I had told you about. For some reason, there's a lot of reports out of that region. I don't know what it is, you know, I don't know why that is, but there was a girl from Serbia that had one in her bedroom and it's weird, dude. I can't imagine being in my house. I couldn't be close quarters with one of these things. I'd probably just lose my mind. (laughs) I'd probably be insane the rest of my life. You would never be able to get anything out of me ever again, because that would be the end of it for me. I'd be in in an asylum or something if I had to be in close quarters with one of these things, you know, and I'm not going to tell you if I had something with me to kill it, I would try. I'm not going to sit there and stare at this thing. I'm going to try, and I'll probably end up dead or something. But I would definitely not just sit there and wait for it to do what it wants to do. But I think it goes back to what Noah and Abel were saying, that these things are ambush predators, and that if you see them face-to-face, there's a good chance they're not going to do anything. He goes, but it's when they walk into the woods that you need to get out of there because they'll probably try to flank you or double back on you. You know what I mean? I do know what you mean. Well, it's about time for us to get out of here, Josh. Do you have any closing comments you'd like to share? Just like I'd said in the last interview, you know, it's not a game going out in the woods and looking for these things. And, and, you know, when people hear about these things, the people who've never seen these things, they're like, well, I'm going to go look and I'm going to find one or or I'm going to shoot one even. And the level of stupidity is just, like I said before, it astounds me. And I, I just encourage people to stay away from these people's property that have these problems, you know, because they don't want you on their property. They don't want you getting hurt or killed for sure. And, you know, these people that deal with these things, they deal with it because they've been dealing with it for decades. The average person who's never seen one of these things is not equipped mentally, physically, emotionally, to confront one of these things and deal with it. And I had this woman out in Oregon that, like I said, she had a very similar story. She had told me where she had acclimated some Bigfoot or Sasquatch, as they call them up there in the Northwest, to her family and that they knew her. And I had heard the same kind of story, this woman not near Kerrville, which is uh, west of San Antonio, the same thing where she knew these Bigfoot and they're friendly or whatever. I have heard that way, way more than I have this dogman thing. I have never heard of this before. This is the first time I have ever heard any 
buddy, even a story where these things were acclimated to people or, or habituated to people. And so the average person trying to wrap their mind around this thing and defend itself or whatever, I mean, there's no way to prepare you for that. And so I just hope that what I'm telling people don't make them go, wow, I just want to go out there and see these things and then end up getting killed. And then that be on my conscience that something happens to them that disappear. So I'm asking everybody, please be cautious when you're going out into the woods, be careful, please don't go out there and try to fight with one of these things or shoot at it or anything like that. If you see one, just back away as slow as you can. Do whatever you got to do to defend yourself, but don't antagonize the situation. And I guess that's all I want is just people to be safe. I don't want anybody getting hurt. And that's one thing that I kind of wrestled with was I just don't want anything bad to come of my words. You know what I'm saying, Vic? I do know what you're saying. I hope no one listening to the show tries to do that too. Yeah, that wouldn't be a wise move. Well, thanks again for coming back on the show, Josh. You know, I appreciate it so much. I'm always happy to talk to you, Vic. You know, like I said, we're friends, and it's always fun to talk to you, (laughs) even about other stuff, not just Dogman. You know, you're a fun guy to talk to. And I'm glad to see your show's doing well, you know. I still, to this day, have not listened to all the episodes, but I'm definitely planning on doing that and just sitting down and having a marathon to try to catch up. Man, I haven't. (laughs) I'm so far behind right now. I always refer people, too, and they try to tell me their encounters. I said, well, you need to tell Vic because. He's going to give you the platform to say what you have to say. You did that for me. You were the first one to get me to come on. I've had others request since then, and I politely tell them no. You know, a couple people got a little ruffled feathers, whatever. But I'm loyal, and like I said, if I have any stories, I'm bringing them to you first. You'll be the one that has them. So that's all I had to say about that. Well, thanks for saying the things you just said, and thanks for doing the things you do. You know, I appreciate it. Have a great night. All right, you too, Vic. Thanks again. We'll see ya. Bye. Bye.